ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next episode of My Final Stallions! On today's episode of Vinyl Stallions, we have a very special guest. This has been months in the making. Saxophone player, composer, conductor, Mr. Javon Bogard. What's going on, y'all? Also Happy. goes by JB. So, how we doing, JB? I'm doing great. I'm going doing great, Club. Thank you for having me uh, on the show. And yeah, it's been a long time coming, but we finally got it rolling now. So, I'm excited. And I'm open to uh, answer some questions and get deep into talking about some music and uh, future endeavors. Hell yeah. Yeah, there, man, there's so many places that we could start, I guess. I'll just start with like your instrument, the saxophone. Like what drew you to that? When did you start playing? When did you like really know that you wanted to like pursue it as more than just a hobby? Uh, so I was originally a piano player. Okay. And then I uh I want to say I was in elementary school and I heard uh um who was it? It wasn't Grover, it was Joe Albright. I heard Joe Albright on the radio for the first time and I you know, I was just like, "Man, what is that?" My uh, my dad, and my mom said, "Oh, that's a saxophone." So, yeah, I, I need to play one of them cuz I was already playing piano, so I I figured since I already knew how to read music, I'm like already halfway there. So I just got to memorize the fingerings and stuff like that, you know. Um, And so I switched to sax. I started playing sax like fifth, fifth, sixth grade, something like that. And um, at that point, I remember my dad had got me three. He had got me three CDs. He had got me a bird with strings, Charlie Parker. He had got me a key of G, which is a Kenny G album. And he had got me this uh, Thelonious Monk album with Charlie Rouse playing saxophone on it. So for me, the Kenny G album, I don't know. It just it was just soft. I didn't like it. You know what I'm saying? It was just even at that age, I was like, man, this is just too tender for me. You know, I'm coming <laughs> from the, the low east side of Cleveland. Like this, this not the sound. <laughs> Thelonious Monk. Um, I like the music. It was just over my head. I knew at that time I just. Like I knew it was cool, but I just knew I couldn't grasp it. It was like I, was like, I just can't understand this at all, right? And so, uh, you know, and I gave all these albums like a pr- pretty thorough listen through. And then uh, my last one was the Charlie Parker Bird with Strings album. And so from there, I listened to that, and I was pretty sold. I was sold on saxophone between Gerald Albright and Charlie Parker, and um, I just remember thinking. When I heard it, because the song that got me was uh, Just Friends. I want to say it was Just Friends on that album. And he has like this crazy sax break on it. And uh, I remember just thinking like, man, this sounds like rap music. And the way he was flowing over it, the way he's playing 16th note lines. At that time, it kind of reminded me of like Busta Rhymes. That's how I felt like at that age. I was like, oh, this sounds like like rap music. And, and even at that age, I could hear... I heard jazz with like a backbeat to it. So even though they were swinging, I could still hear the two and four. So I could hear it halftime, no matter how, like what they was playing. And so when he was playing it, um, let me, see, let me try to explain it for you. So he's like, I can't remember the line exactly, but it's like, he's swinging two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, whatever he did. Right. So I'm hearing it like, one, two, three. Uh. I'm hearing it like right there. And so for me, that was like, I could, it, it just blended with hip hop for me. So I kind of just ran with that at that point. Um, and I started taking sex seriously. So I, I left my elementary school. I went to, my elementary middle school. Then I finished middle school at Cleveland School of Arts. So I went over there um, under Demetrius Stymus. I was uh, playing sax, switched over to tenor sax from alto. And then they brought in Chris Anderson and Dennis Reynolds, which uh, they ended up being like longtime uh, mentors of mine up to today. 
And um, yeah, I wasn't really playing. I didn't know that people play music for a living. I was just playing. So, you know, I'll go out here and play a gig. I just enjoy being out playing playing saxophone with people. It didn't, it didn't bother me. And so um, I want to say probably like 14 or 15, probably 14, 14, 15, yeah. Um, Chris, Mr. Anderson, he started getting us gigs. You know, it wasn't that much, like, you know, $35, 50 bucks, 60 bucks. And then from there, I was like, yeah, ain't no reason to do anything else. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, I'm oh, doing yeah. what I love. I'm with my friends. You know, I get to meet new people, eat good food, play music. Like, you can't really beat that. So No better life. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Thanks yeah. for unpacking that. That is, uh, I, I'm going to go back to what you said about Kenny G, how you said that was so tender and soft. And then there's ways that it could be put into like rap and, and then there's ways with the saxophone that you can literally just attack and like it is just yeah. absolutely violating. And it's I mean, to a sense, I guess a lot of instruments can do that. But the saxophone, to me, at least takes the cake like that is what is, I don't know, changing um, heads, turning heads completely every single time it's played. And I feel like no matter how it's played. True. No, I hear you. I hear you for sure. It's uh, I mean. I try my best to put my personality personality through my plan, you know? So uh, that's like the whole thing. Like, I don't want to play anything I can't sing. I don't want to play anything I wouldn't sing. I don't want to play something that I wouldn't want to hear or think that's like makes sense. So yeah, uh, yeah, saxophone could definitely uh, go either way. But like I said, when I was listening to Kenny G, it just, it was too relaxing. I was like, I don't know, man. I was just, I wasn't too much of a fan of it. And then, when I heard Charlie Parker, it was just a um a level of like intellect and and seriousness about it. And then I could still, like I said, I could still feel like the backbeat. So for me, I was I was sold. I was like, yeah, this this is it. Yeah, that's interesting that your dad like chose those three albums because those are all like they're all jazz, but they're all like totally different. Way different, exactly. Exactly. So can you uh, break down? So as a person walking on the street and you see a saxophone, I mean, that thing is intimidating. It has different buttons. I don't even know. I feel like I could like lift it up underneath and find one underneath the front of that thing. And uh, I mean, I was just going to say, are you able to like break down and just like how it like works and how your fingers are actually moving? Yeah. So um. I, I kind of consider saxophone as far as the horn instruments, probably the closest visually to piano because everything's laid out. It's just laid out vertically instead of horizontally. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, um, and then the saxophone, it has pretty much finger combinations, but everything, everything has its own, its own set. So like one finger is B, two fingers is A, three fingers is G, but it's it's pretty much like that around the horn. If you go up the octave, it's the same deal. Um, where I feel like trumpet instruments like trumpet, trombone, that's when you start getting tricky because you have to you're put you're you have to pull off multiple notes with the same finger. So it depends on like so it's like uh, it's big on your embouchure. Um, and the the range that they have is it's it's crazy. Uh trombone and brass brass instruments in itself is crazy. But yeah, I think saxophone is more so just uh kind of like piano, but just vertical. So you can see all the notes and see the layout. Um I know when I was at Oberlin, I was studying with Gary Bartz, and he had told me he uh he said, if you ever play with a uh, trumpet player or a trombone player and they could play as good as you or they they in that range. They better than you. Yeah, they they probably are better musicians than you. They <laughs> because the difficulty of the instrument. It's so many ways. Well, I'll say it like this: it's more ways to mess up on those instruments than it is saxophone. Gotcha. Yeah. No. Yeah, okay. that's eye opening. Because yeah, is. like I just think of like them 
to be in like kind of the same thing. Like they're both wind instruments. You blow into them. You have to have your fingers in a certain place. But I didn't even think about it. Like there's way more buttons on the sax. Yeah, the saxophone is crazy. I mean, if you think about it, that's why you hear in a general sense, that's why you hear more good saxophone players than you do trumpet or trombone because it's the easier of the three. Dang. See, I, so that's why. But the thing is, once you get to the level on trombone where you and trumpet where you could really play really good, then you're really, really, really good. That's a you're on a whole different level at that point. You know what I'm saying? Like once you get to the point where you can match playing with a saxophone player, you can outplay a saxophone player, then it puts you in a different percentile of musicians than than everybody else. Damn. Okay. You like, hear good trombone or good trumpet is really, really good. It's like eye opening, like jaw dropping good. Compared to sax, because you hear so much good saxophone all the time. Big time. Mm -hmm. Do they transfer over at all in your like like would you say? Like I think uh the brass instruments, because saxophone is a woodwind because of the the reed. Uh that's it's bamboo. So we um we're a woodwind instrument. Their instrument is brass. I think for them it transfer over a little bit different, better because the way their mouthpiece is made is more of just like a straight circle. Compared to ours, where we got to, you know, put our teeth on the top and all that other stuff. But uh, I think uh, brass instruments, trans as far as your ears and being able to pick up notes and pick up certain things, I think it transfer over a little quicker. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Damn. A lot of yeah. shit. This is the this is the best part about vinyl Stanley's for me, man. I get to learn. Like that is truly some shit I did not know. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Spruce. You're like JB. You, I think you are the first person we've had on where like a wind instrument is your primary instrument. Like we've had other people on that like played it like in middle school or high school band, but like the guitar is their first instrument or something else. I think yeah. you're the first person we've had on where like a wind instrument is like their main thing. Right. Yeah. I mean. Like, I love it. Like I said, I love I love the saxophone. I play. I didn't play it all of them. Barry, alto, soprano. I tenor. was gonna be one of my questions. Like, which of the different saxes is your favorite? Pro uh, uh, I play tenor, but probably alto. Okay, yeah, alto is like the one that almost looks like a clarinet, right? No, that's soprano. Alto looks ah. like a small tenor. It okay. looks like yeah, a smaller version with tenor. And, and why is that your favorite giant one? one? Uh, hold on. So back uh, first, you said, why is that my favorite? Yeah, yeah. sorry. We <laughs> asked at the same time. I'm just jumping yeah. the gun, dude. I'm telling you, this is, yeah, like Club said, you're the first one on. I have, like, questions loaded up for you that I just need so to answer. my favorite, um, at least for me, because I don't have big big hands, and so it uh is more comfortable. And I actually, my my facility and dexterity around the horn is just a little bit more cleaner because it's just a more smaller, compact horn. Um, and it just cuts through. Alto is it's a higher pitch instrument. Uh, if you playing at church or you just playing lead or something like that, or you by yourself, alto is a great um, horn to have. And, the, and it's smaller, so I don't have to carry a heavy case around all the time. Bang. <laughs> you know? um, what was the other question? I, I was just saying like the bear because you were running through like the different ones. I the baritone's like the giant one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the one that's uh that's the, the lowest of the well the of the normal saxophones. You I mean you can start getting into like contrabass. If you ever looked into those, those joints is like eight feet tall and you gotta get like a, a ladder to get on it. But um for as far as normal saxophones, yeah, the bear is the lowest they usually team up with the uh trombones and the bass trombones and hold that low end down you yeah. ever mess around with the flute or the clarinet yeah yeah i played all of that i'm actually uh working on getting back into that some of that stuff this year for uh some abstract sounds uh recordings and s some stuff for the horn section as well um but yeah i play i play flute a little bit in high school, but mostly in college. When I was at Auburn, I played flute in the big band. And I played uh, clarinet. I actually played clarinet 
And we got to play with uh, Sonny Rollins, bass player, Rufus Reed, uh, years ago. And I got to play a um, bass clarinet for him on one of the shows. Damn. Yeah, That's it was cool. cool. It was good. Damn. Is, yeah. Yeah, so you hear people, uh, at least for guitarists and stuff, be like, oh, you play a PRS, so you play a Fender and stuff. But when you think of the instruments, you just think of a saxophone, a flute and stuff. What are the brands? Are there some specific brands out there? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm uh I play a Selmer Mark Six. That's a that's like a historic that's they call it the golden horn of you know jazz. All the big greats played it. It was a gift passed down to me, so it was really a blessing. Um but yeah, you got Yanagasawa, Yamaha, Selmer, um, then you have a bunch of like brands that they they brand it's kind of like car cars, you know what I mean? Then they got different levels. Like they might have like Toyota, but then we got like Camry. Then we got the the other cars. So depends on your budget which ones you can get. Uh, my horn, my horn is like driving a vintage car. So for me, I'm actually like in in a place where I'm trying to give my horn a rest because you're not supposed to take your old school off too much. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to put my baby up because my horn is. From the sixties. Wow. So yeah. So do you have like a cheaper horn that you used to just like practice and like whale on? I got a I I got my alto that I do, but I I usually always practice on my tenor. I usually always practice on my same horn. So yeah, this year I'm actually thinking about looking to just grab me something else to take the time off that horn and let it let it rest some. Yeah. Not too much going on. So, 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 so again, something that is uh, interesting about what you do, JB, is most people when they think of horns, they think of it as like a complimentary and think of it as something that is putting the spice on top of music. But right. for you to be able to do that and then to say, okay, I'm going to be a composer with this and build around what I am doing. I mean, where did that begin? Where you uh, wanted to create some original music? <sighs> Okay, so I, I I didn't start writing original music. Um, I got the idea right after I got to high school. Like as soon as my probably my senior year of high school, um, our teacher Eric Gould he had this uh like music theory composition class. Um, it was more so theory, and um, we had to you know pick a song to arrange. I can't remember like the whole situation, but. I remember um, at the time, it was this song by Bobby Hutcherson called Lil B's Poem. And I just, I really liked the whole song is uh, the way the song flowed, the 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 harmony of the tune. It was an old song, but it was just a killing tune. And so um, I remember going to my teacher and asking him like, hey man, has anybody ever started this song off from the end of the song? And he was like, what you mean? And I was just like, because the song, it has like a walk up. It's a waltz. And so I was just like, has anybody ever played it from the beginning of the song? Uh, from the end? Because the song generally just starts off. So I, he was like, well, no. I was all right. I think I'm going to go ahead and try to come up with the my own arrangement where we we started off from the beginning in the tune like we started the beginning off at the end and so uh i started it off and it went it went really well uh and we did we performed it fast forward i got to college and um the i kind of was like in the change of i was in the midst of like my musical change like i was getting older the stuff that I that I thought I liked, I still like, but I was kind of like getting into different genres. So I always grew up in the church, but modern church music, Ty Tribbett, Kim Burrell, James Fortune, uh, the Clark Sisters, the Shears, you know, I ne I never heard of a lot of that music. I grew up listening to like super old gospel music. So um for me, when I heard that. I kind of was like, man, what am I even playing jazz for? I'm tripping. Like, <laughs> what am I playing? You know what I'm saying? Because the music was, it was jazz plus more. Almost like jazz and dance music mixed together. Um, 
And from playing that stuff, it made me just wanted to continue my uh, composition. So like I said, I got to college and one of my good friends, Lawrence Galloway, um, he was a composer. He's a composer and another friend of ours, Deshaun Jones and Shea Pierre, they were all composing at that time. And um, I remember I used to sit around and sometimes like after rehearsal, they leave their music. I just steal their sheet music, go home, practice the piano part. But like, oh man, I like this movement or I like this movement. And from there, I just started creating my own ideas. So actually our first single that we released in August, Hailstorm, that's the first song I ever wrote. I wrote that, um, yeah, I was 18. So it took forever to release it, almost 12 years. But um, yeah, 12 years. But uh, yeah, from there, I just gospel, gospel music kind of helped influence my uh, composition and, you know, wanting to write and things like that. And I just kept going, you know, and, and a lot of times I will say that not only do I have ideas, but I go out a lot of times in certain things that I want to hear that I don't hear musically. And so I have to just make it because so nobody nobody's playing it. So. I have to be the one to do that. So that's that's kind of the thing. Hell yeah. I mean, that seems like a great creation process. Like I've been looking for something with this sound. Can't find it. So yeah. that's gonna be mine. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, the whole time really it's nothing. I mean, it's kind of it's difficult. The music is difficult, I'm not gonna lie. Uh it is difficult, but my whole goal is like to bring jazz and dance music back together. That's 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 the whole thing. Like at some point jazz and dance got mis like got lost. And um I remember uh seeing this video of this club out in Detroit and they were literally dancing to uh this DJ had put a track of John Coltrane solo from Giant Steps. And he had four on the four playing. Mm, mm, boom, boom, boom. Okay. And they were literally playing John Coltrane solo and the club is packed. They in there dancing. And I'm just like, what? This is it. You get what I'm saying? Like, this is, they 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 don't hear these chord changes. They not, it's the fact that they could dance to it is what matters. So a lot of times when you go to the, because you know, we go to the jam band shows. We didn't been to the jam band concerts. That's how we met. You hear a lot of the music and it's like, it's danceable. Like, oh, yeah, it's great. I could dance to it. But then when you listen to it, they've been playing over the same sound for like five minutes. Mm -hmm. They just literally jamming. It's over the same thing. Totally. So <laughs> and when you go to a jazz concert, the dance feel is gone. But what you hear is way more intellectual. It feels but You just hear something that's that you, you feel like you should have heard. And then that's why when you go to church, church, like especially like Black, Baptist, gospel churches. That's why their stuff is really crazy because they're mixing deep uh, jazz harmony. They're mixing classical harmony. And because it's pretty much praise and worship music, we having a party for God. You see what I'm saying? You know, so it's really, it's really just bringing the dance back together the whole time. Um, uh, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's that's my goal right now. And, and also just like, making music that uh that people can that i say people could dance to but as if as the musician as somebody that's playing it it's actually fun to play yep and that's the other thing like i, I want that middle ground where it's like oh man this music sounds cool but the musician is not bored because they're not playing over the same thing for five minutes they actually have a sound that's continuously moving and changing but since the rhythm section the drums the percussion the bass all that is locked in nobody really pays attention and so everybody's having fun it's a win-win yeah totally yeah no i feel like yeah that's like a key distinction between like jazz and jam bands like jam bands like they're both based on improvisation but like you said like there's certain rules with jam bands and generally like the rhythm section like when you're in like a certain part of the song is like kind of monotonous 
Whereas yeah. like jazz, there's like no rules at like any time for any section of the music. Yeah, sir. Jazz, uh, I mean, and it, it's very, well, this is the thing. Jazz music is very deceptive. Very deceptive. So like, you might think somebody's playing, but the whole time everybody's lis- listening for one cue. And it could be something s- super simple, but that's what they're listening to move to the next step. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's, it's a lot, but I think that um, once people understand that uh, you got to you gotta kind of blend the two, you got to bring the dance back then then jazz becomes the pop music of today again because you think about when jazz was the pop music of america that was in the roaring 20s and 30s yeah across the entire entire united states people literally hand danced to jazz music and the minute it became like you know great depression happened people couldn't afford big bands torn torn was messed up um so you can start getting these small groups and then the music started getting intellectual to where you notice by the sixties, they sitting there with their legs cross smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Chilling. You know what I'm saying? And 30 years, the music didn't change that much. And then you had the seventies. So you got like Herbie Hancock. He's one of the guys who like kept it alive as much as he possibly could. Knee yeah. deeper, you know, but, um, we need more people like him that, uh, that's uh that's trying to keep that alive and that's kind of what i'm doing that's what i'm trying to do now is just to keep my own identity while staying relevant with the current sound yeah no like herbie i've like that that's like kind of a great example of like what you said where like a lot of his stuff like especially like late 70s early 80s is like almost resembling more of like soul motown music than it is like 60s jazz like very funky like super interesting bass grooves and then yeah of course emphasizers he was singing on the vocal that's what i'm saying like (laughs) that was so ahead of his time you know him and wayne shorter and all them cats was killing it killing the game so i mean at that time, I think I even I really think even then some of that stuff might have not really been appreciated as much as it was to like afterwards. Like once the seventies had passed, and we get later on, then they're like, "Oh yeah, these cats was way ahead of their time." Like, yeah, they got Miles it. Davis to start dipping into that sound. Like yeah. Miles eighty stuff is like just like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, they know start sounding like Law and Order <laughs> after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Miles Davis started sounding crazy, but that's what I'm saying. It's just like, we have to stay, we have to stay relevant. Like we know that right now, um, like dance music, EDM, techno, stuff like that, that. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. And I mean, and you could, people could take their writing ability somewhere else. Like I, I even thought about, I was like, huh, maybe by the end of 2024, I should try to take my writing abilities and go and make some country music. Partner up with a writer, partner up with somebody who writes vocals, and I just write the charts. Yeah. yeah. I've been listening yeah. to a lot of country music recently, and they're yeah. definitely artists that like use saxophone and right, music. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the way to go, man. That's uh I mean, composition in itself can take you so many places. It's it's crazy. Uh I got um Actually, two of my friends I went to college with, Chase Jackson and uh, Jake Silverman. Shout out to Jake Silverman for being on um, featured on Ohio Nights. Mr. Button Masher, killing it on the uh, um, keyboard, did a six cent solo for us. Uh, and if you haven't heard of Button Masher, go ahead and check him out, too. Big time. Uh, he does like 8-bit video game music and everything. It's, it's insane. Um, yeah i checked out a little bit of his stuff because yeah like i saw he was on ohio nights so i was like it's probably pretty good let's go see what some of this music's like yeah and he's sick he's sick man um totally it was it was a blessing to even you know because you know he he's a grammy award winning artist but like even when i talk to him he's just like dude you my homie (laughs) 
I got you. Just send the song over. It's, just, it's like, you know, it was it was no like, oh, I'm big time now. You got to run this through my my agent and do this. He's just like, no, nah, I, I got you. Just send it over. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Do it. And honestly, he probably did it in one take because he's that good. <laughs> to be honest with you, to really be honest with you, he probably did. He's he's a freak of nature musically. Uh, totally. Well, yeah. So let's since we're already talking about it, let's talk about the two abstract sound singles. We got Hailstorm. We got Ohio Nights. I guess, yeah. Like where where do you record those? Who does the production? Like, yeah, break it down. So uh, the F- Ohio Nights we did at um, Breakthrough Studios. Uh, where's is, where's is Breakthrough? It's in Cleveland, it's, but it's on the south side. Uh, what Charles Charles Fresco Tubi? If you don't know him, that's that's the cat. Is a uh, black owned studio. Uh, one of the, like the highest rated studios in like Cleveland. Um, they've done work for voiceover and stuff for BMF, all types of they they done some big work in there. Um, so I, I did it in there. Me, I know Charles, like before he even opened the studio when he was more so like a full time, like musician, he was doing music more so. And, uh, you know, he knew I had the song. He's like, Hey man, you got to come over and lay it down. Um, and this, with that being my first song, I was kind of nervous. Um, didn't really know what to expect. The whole time I was like stressing over my, like over myself. I'm like, do I sound good? Do they sound good? Uh, but like I said, Hailstorm is a song that I wrote so long ago, and I was just like, it's about time that we, we uh, you know, release this song. And it and Abstract Sounds is going on what two years, two two and some change years old. So I was like, yo, we have to, we have to start getting this music out. So I recorded with him. He mixed, he mixed and mastered the uh that first song, and then um my second Ohio Nights we recorded it in. Akron, so I recorded okay. with, with one of my homies, uh, Aiden, at his, one of his spots. We we did that, um, kind of more like in the live setting recording. Uh oh, my dog then came over here. Oh, he's chilling. <laughs> Let's see him. Oh, what a good boy! Yeah, his name Pork Chop. All right, Pork yeah, Chop, chilling. I say. Look, look on Spruce's screen. We got the studio yeah, cat, too. Yeah, apparently <laughs> I mean, uh, Clarence had uh, smelled the dog from through the screen. Oh, no, too. <laughs> All the animals in here. Yeah, but... Um, I'm left out now. Right. <laughs> what else here? Um, was, what were we... We were talking about... Um, Where you were Ohio Nights. Nights. Like, yeah, so All Nights in Hailstorm. So, yeah. Uh, oh, so yeah, we recorded in Akron. Like I said, it was more of a live setting how we did it. Um, you know, I had the guys Ashton on drums, David, David Rhodes on uh bass, me, Frank Walton on trumpet, I had Rob Morrow on keys, and then uh, our original piano player, Eli Hanley, who lives in uh California now, I sent it over to him to lay some more stuff on that uh organ. I think he did some synthesizer stuff for me on there. And then um, we had Tim Murth on guitar. Tim Murth did some guitar work on there. And uh, to top it off, I got Colin Cook to end the song uh, with a killing guitar solo. Uh, Colin Cook, this guitar player from uh, Cali, amazing guitar player, just straight shredder. So I got him and he blazed it. Kick ass. Um, Dude, no, those, those songs are fucking incredible. And again, everyone go check out Abstract Sounds right now and um and get a go- and get get a fucking going because I was bumping that shit. I couldn't stop bumping Hailstorm in my car. And oh yeah, and- now I'm gonna have to go ahead and send y'all uh send y'all the Dropbox link to uh Ohio Night so y'all can check that out. Listen to the whole song. Oh Hell please, yeah. yes. Yeah, before we get out before we uh in the night because I, I work third shift tonight, so I'll be up all night. <laughs> yeah no i'd love that because yeah like all i've heard so far is what's been on instagram like- yeah yeah the song so okay i'm not finished with all night so um i don't know if you guys do you guys know nathan davis and the Myrables? them guys you have to them? 
Do not. Uh, no. Yeah. You gotta can't check say. him out. You gotta check him out. Please do. You got me on here. You got. He's another saxophone band leader. Actually, he's a. Uh, if y'all not doing nothing December first, I don't. He just called me to possibly play with him at the Bob Stop. He's doing like a a large ensemble this time. It's gonna it's gonna be killing. Oh shit! Yeah, I'm running Gordon Square, man. That's the yeah. Story. Y'all can get there. I mean, I promise you, like Nathan, they he he's killing. Like if I I was just telling him, I said, man, if we had a record label, I would put you on there. I'll put your band right there with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Nathan yeah. Davis and the Marbles. And the Marbles. Yep. Yep. December first, they'd be at the Bob Stop. So um. Yeah. So Nathan was like, uh, he was like, man, you gotta. Cause I, I love I like Tube. He he set off, um, at uh, Hailstorm. It sounded great, and he was telling me he was like, man, you know, I it, it was a hard song because he he's not really used to recording seven people and mixing seven instruments and stuff like that. That's you know that's a a specialized skill, but he did kill it. He killed it. Um, so what happened was uh, one of our friends, Tyler Tyler Cratchit guitar player he uh uh nathan was like well man you should see if you should see if tyler would be down to mix some of your music you know um because he mixes nathan stuff and i i listen to nathan music nathan music sound great but me and him actually took time to like really listen to it. he was like no go home really listen to it and tell me what you think so i went home i listened to it i called him back and I said, like, you know, who's who's all on this project? He was like, man, it's it's me, really. And I'm like, man, he made just synthesized instruments sound like that. Oh yeah, I gotta call him up and see how we're gonna work this out. So I called <laughs> him up. But like you remember, I told you guys we recorded Hailstorm or not Hailstorm. We recorded All How Nights in more like a live setting. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like isolated like a uh, Hailstorm was. And man, when I say he put his foot in it in the recording and completely destroyed it and completely destroyed it, I mean he 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 killed it, man. So he we sent it to him. Uh I think I had Aaron Grayer lay because last the last minute of the song, I ended up getting and I don't know why I do this, but I just got like an idea. I was like, man. Yeah, he was playing. We got the bass line laid down on it. And it's super funky. But the song is like, it's like a double time feel. Like I said, drum and bass kind of feel. So I was like, well, this funk feel that you got going on is like halftime. It's like, it kind of, I'm not going to say it slows the song down, but it's almost its own thing. So I was like, man, how can we, uh, how can we improve on this? And so I was like, you know what? I want you to play over the chords like arpeggiate them, like, like pretty much just play each note that's in the chord while the song is moving, and then we gonna we gonna add to that. He sent it to back to me. It sounded crazy. He sent it back to me. I'm like, okay, boom. We put some effects on it, so now it sounds like a completely different instrument. And Tyler, I mean, man, Tyler hooked it up. He he completely hooked the song up, and I mean, he was very like transparent with me the entire time like any problems any issues he was calling me and we was working it out so yeah oh, how nice was smooth and we're actually uh after that as soon as we finished those last parts we actually got back right back in the studio and we started recording three more songs mm-hmm. already yeah so we're going into we're gonna go into july 2024 we're going pretty hard i got um uh i got this rapper from cleveland who now lives in philly my dude Two Saint, check him out. Uh, two, his uh, name is Two Saint. Two S S A I N T. When I tell you, like he's probably my favorite rapper. I I wouldn't even call him a le- rapper. I call him a lyricist. Okay. Two Saint is crazy. I mean, he's a it's he's kind of like Kendrick Lamar, J Cole, and Andre Three Thousand like put together. Because right, he like, he kind of sing pretty high praise, bro. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Like. Is because he sings, but then he raps too. But he's not like a, he's not like a R and B singer. He kind of got like the rap hip hop sing. You just got to check it out. It's fire, but it's very musical. His play with words is crazy, and he actually like 
can back it up on stage. You know what I'm saying? A lot of rappers, you hear them, they need to use the track to perform. Yeah. No, he 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 got it like that. Um, so I uh I uh got two songs with him that we're doing that's uh that's gonna be really killing. And I think that's kind of gonna be the beginning of my bridge of like working and meeting jazz with hip hop. You know? That's fucking awesome, man. And you said July twenty twenty four is the target as of now? Uh no 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 no. Uh hopefully shoot. If these guys get it done, man, January, July, by the time, by the time July comes, we have a whole nother, I got a whole nother project we'll be doing. Love it. Love it, man. Now that's, I'm that's sure. hype. You're able to work with a bunch of different people um, and be able to, like you said, like pick and choose uh, yeah. who you want on each song and shit. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we have to like, cause we got to remember, like, even though the talent level is high, we still in Ohio. Like, you know what I mean? So is we have to connect and use each other networks and, and stuff like that to the highest ability. That's how I feel. So I look at it as like, okay, if my friend, he's a rapper, if this person dance or this person sing, yeah, none of us are really big, but we're talented. So let's get together and build a bigger network. Yep. Totally. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the essence of like what we're doing with this podcast. It's like there's like all these different artists that like not everyone knows about that are like really freaking talented. So like yeah. that's kind of our goal is like try to like let people know about it. And hey man, I appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody else do too, because this, you know, I was thinking, um, talking to some friends recently on uh just improvements that could be made in the scene you know they always talk about that we go through that every year mm-hmm. about what can be made and um i think the one thing i i said was i feel like there's no young people outlets <laughs> media outlets you know what i'm saying there's nobody that's like willing to be journalists there's nobody that's willing to do interviews so the few podcasts that we do have they're a blessing. I think that all the um, musicians and artists should try to tap in with you guys as much as possible, to be honest. You know what I'm saying? Like, Hell yeah. we all benefit from it. Yeah. No, it, yeah, exactly, man. You you hit it on the head and clupped it too, man, with what we're trying to do here. And the beautiful thing is these conversations last forever. And sure, we might only talk for an hour now, man, but our connection and networking is forever as well and even though it seems like a quick convo man it's yeah a blessing as well to be able to have people willing to come in and talk about their craft and things that many people may not know about and just how the music world is created and how it goes around um so yeah thank you yeah, all the artists thank, thank you as well man it's it's fucking great to see but i got a quick question so we talked about how we uh had saw abstract sounds back in April here in Cleveland, Ohio, and it just jaw dropping. I like Club and I couldn't stop talking. Like there was like six different bands that night, and we just went home. And we we're just like, "Holy fuck, what did we just witness?" Yeah, dude, like, how? Okay, f- can I just ask too? Sorry to interrupt, sir. How the fuck did you find that drummer? You said Ashton's name, right? Yeah, run us through uh, the whole lineup, actually, dude, man. Because I I'm a drummer, so I like. Yeah, that just blows oh, my man. mind. Oh, he's the best. I was actually just well, I know Ashton because um because of Deshaun Jones. So what happened was I was in Oberlin as in college, and uh Ashton had started playing with Deshaun's group Nomadic. And uh, you know, fast forward to 2020, like 2021, 2022, Ashton started calling me for gigs because he has his own band called Audacity for Sale. So he was calling me for gigs every once in a while. And I had just started abstract sounds and I was having issues with my rhythm section at the time. And so like, um, I, you know, with me playing with him and then he had his bass player, he pretty much had a rhythm section. I had horn players. So I was just like, well, you know, I got music. I got original because his band, more, they do a more cover band. Mm-hmm. So, uh, ah, this dog, hold on. <laughs> come on dog you gotta get up out of here i'm gonna have to kick you out the club sorry <laughs> no it's all good i had to kick him out the club gotta do sorry, it sorry pork chop yeah 
he had he too much. Had by, too much. Man, he he got abandoned by everybody. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, what I was going to say, uh, sheesh, messing with him made me forget what I was even on. Just saying, just then. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, run us through the abstract sounds lineup that you usually run with. Oh, um, so now we have it's me. Frank Walton on trumpet and keyboard, um, depending on the gig. I got Jonah Ferguson, which is he's our newest member of the band uh, on guitar. He's been killing it lately. Uh, Ashton Thomas on drums and Aaron Grayer on bass. And then uh, I just recently started calling uh, Joe F to come in and fill in with keys uh, for us. And he's an amazing player. I don't know if you guys know Joe F, but he's a, a Cleveland cat, but um he's he he got it actually he, he's another great person to uh to bring on because he uh i want to say he he was born it might be a cerebral palsy he was born with disability and still is like a crazy piano player crazy i'm talking about like insane <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's amazing he he uh he has a story for sure that's another oh, yeah. good on the show. I have to look into him, yeah. Yeah. But no, Ashton's a freak. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Ashton's a freak, man. He learns music really fast. Um he's always on time. I mean, I really I don't have issues with Ashton. You know, he's 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 the he's the guy. He always has great uh like recommendations as far as like, oh we we, we should add a song or something like that. And he's just always a, a good spirit and a good cat to hang around too. Yeah, he makes it look so effortless too. Like that's the thing that like just blew my mind. He's playing like all this crazy shit and it like he just looks so unbothered. Like it's like not even hard for him. <laughs> he be playing like the music is too easy. <laughs> he's just like hard. He's like, Y'all don't have nothing harder than this? Like harder. Yeah, he's yeah. he's crazy. Actually, uh it's funny you say that because I was listening to some of this uh this new stuff that I'm uh that I'm writing, you know, that I told you that we're doing with Two Saint with the rapper. And I'm just listening to him, to his drumming. And I'm just like, man, this dude's crazy. The sound. And then we got like a new setup that we've been recording with the drums. Um, so it's like way clearer. You can hear everything way better. So like I'm I'm super excited for it for 2024. And I've been writing, um, I'm actually doubling back on all this music and I'm I'm dropping arrangements with like strings larger horn sections so like all these songs are going to get repurposed like i'm just waiting till till we get about four more tunes out and then um i'm actually going to release another arrangement of uh hailstorm again hell yeah <laughs> love it no that's sick there there's an artist that i've been listening to a lot recently called sturgill simpson he's like a country artist and that's like something he did so he put out like four albums and then his fifth and sixth albums are like bluegrass arrangements of like these country songs that he's already written so it's like super interesting yeah yeah i think that for sure like you know with us and not trying to get too deep, but with, with people with us only being on this world one time and for a limited time, it's like we really gotta get in the studio and record and push out as many ideas. You know, um, I remember one of my teachers, uh, Ralph Jones, out when I was at Oberlin. Now, mind you, Ralph Jones played with Yusef Latif. Okay, Yusef Latif is was in the circle with John Cole training them. Yeah, cats. you know oh, what I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember I had this actually it's one of the songs we were gonna release. It wasn't Hellstorm, it's uh Last of the Few, which we recorded that as well. And um it's this the form is long, like it's it's short actually. The form is short. Most of my songs have long forms. Hellstorm is a long like by the time you get to the top of the song again, it's like a minute that passed already, which is relatively long for most songs. Most songs they go around 16 measures. My songs go like 40 measures before we come back to the top of the song. So it's like two or three times longer than a normal song. And I remember writing my my tune and um I felt like it was short. And I remember talking to Ralph. I said, man, 
I said, Ralph, this the song. I'm like, I really like the song, but it's short. And he said, who said it was short? I said, I mean, it feels like it's short to me. He said, and you know, he he put, he kind of made me feel like, well, maybe that's honestly just the end of the idea. And now you're trying to force something more than what's really there. And, you know, he got into it was just telling me, like, how much music and what we write and what we create affects the world and the people. And he was like, you know, by you not recording and pushing this song out, you don't know what lives you missed out on saving. Just because you want to sit at home and say the song not longer. Damn. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And it's, it's true. It's people out here that, you know, the life is rough and they feel like there's no there's no way out. And they might go home and feel crazy and then put on some song, put on music, and, you know, they think about life different. Like, music is powerful. You know, it's up there with religion because you got you can't touch it. You can't feel it. I mean, you can't like grab it and, and break it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like air. It's like the spirit. So it's uh it's very important that we get the music out. And like before, you know, I'll say I, I feel like a lot of musicians, we be like, man, it's not good enough. This music, this or this recording is not good enough. It's like, man, it is what it is. Yep. At a certain point, it's uh this is a God given gift, and what we doing is really Music is only really a vehicle. It's not who I am. It's only a vehicle for me to get to the next place, which is pushing peace, pushing prosperity, pushing, you know, financial understanding, whatever it may be. Music is that platform for me. Now, for other people, for somebody like LeBron James, it ain't playing the saxophone. You know what I'm saying? His <laughs> platform is basketball. So he uses it, you know, wherever that may be. Back in the day, especially when you start thinking about, you know, Ali, Frazier, and them. They, especially Ali, because he was he, Muhammad Ali was somebody that uh, spoke for the community. His his platform was boxing, and he used boxing probably if he was an heavyweight champion. Nobody gonna listen to you. True. So it took, so it took that for people to uh, listen to him. And so, like I said, I'm I'm really doing all this right and to say that it's really just getting, giving praise to the most high and just giving, um, just putting myself in a position to, uh, I hate to use the word preach, but you know, just keep some positive stuff to the people. Yeah. You know, keep it rolling. So, yep. That's what I got going on now. I just, I this it. dog is so persistent. <laughs> Dude, that is a powerful statement you just said. And what can sum up a lot of things, feelings for a lot of people and how important music is in just the world and how it is with everyone every single day. Um, nah, man, that's awesome. We could, yeah, I just want to leave it at that, man. You spoke to that fucking perfectly. Oh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just try to not to, I think we look at, music on such a like a surface level man you know what i'm saying just like oh especially now because now we got like social media and stuff like that so it's so quick to like even like even to like not even chime in or really listen to a song but it's like yeah a lot of a lot of times you never know you don't know who you saving or what doors you might be opening for yeah. yourself or for the next person you know for sure. I guess totally. there's one thing I want to unpack that you stated, and it was that, uh, I mean, what the main thing was put out the music because you don't know what lives you're saving, but and you're so stuck on an idea and you put things in that shouldn't be there. And it is important. And you're doing it right there with Hailstorm, a song in my mind. And it's just recently hit me is never done growing. And whether you record it some way, you could perform it live differently. You could re-record it in a different manner. Mm -hmm. It's just what it is at that time. And that's just something really big that I've not done with my music yet. And I just have to say, fuck it and put it out there. And if I want to change something later, man, I'll change that shit later. Bro, especially when you don't have a big following. Do you, you actually have the, like, that's the decent thing about not ha being big. Like you could actually drop a song like, oh, I don't like it and just take it offline and redo it. And it's like, ain't that mean people really gonna care about it? You know, but I look at it as like each song, everything we do 
like on that in that sense also is like an asset. So you, that's the smartest thing to do is have different versions. Like you, I, I was talking to somebody. Um, you look at like some like SZA, H E R, some of the new R R and B rappers or singers, or her. You listen to them. They literally have three versions of the same song. They got the acoustic version, the band version, the version with no. And then they got the instrumental, right? Mind you, they getting paid off all three or four of them versions. Now, imagine if we went back to like, back to the old hip hop where you got Lil Wayne, Gucci Man, and them cats never repurposed songs. Imagine how rich they would be. These dudes didn't drop a million one time songs, one version. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, like, if, if these guys had dropped the instrumental, then dropped the song, then dropped the remix, then dropped the acoustic, then dropped, you know. So, I say, like, Man, F it. Drop the music. Get it yeah. on out there. Cause the sitting around, bro, is it's we fried to just sit around. And just I know I know some cats in Cleveland right now, bro, that's in their 40s that got music out that they wrote in the early 2000s. That they're like, hey man, can you record horns on it? Like recently, in the last couple of years, like can you record horns on it. And I'm listening to the music. Like, when did you write this? Like, oh, I wrote this in 2006, like. Dude, you would be famous right now if you dropped this. <laughs> like you wrote something in 2006 and then in 2010, that became the sound. You was already four years ahead of it. And it's because it's like, oh, my music isn't ready. Is it your music not ready or are you not ready? Bang, right there. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Go and fucking record your music. But more importantly, go and listen to Abstract Sounds because yeah. that shit is out of this fucking world. And, you know, JB, we can't thank you enough for just taking the time to come on Vinyl Stallions and breaking some shit down. This was one of my most enjoyable conversations. Oh, yeah, bro. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it, man. And uh, I'm down to talk anytime for sure. Now, we'll for sure have you back on. I can promise you that. Um, but I will say there's always an encore here on Vinyl Stallions. And I'm going to let Klepp take it away. All right. All right. So, yeah, the question is, what is your most memorable concert experience? And this could be like you were attending, you were playing. It could be like good, bad, crazy, emotional, anything. Um, I think I have I have. Maybe like two, two situations. Yeah, I'll just drop them real quick. So the first was uh when I went to Oberlin and heard uh Deshaun Jones group Nomadic with Ashton playing at, well, it was Zaire playing drums at the time, but Ashton ended up playing drums later on. But at that time, I was just like astonished, man. Like I <laughs> I mean, I'm not even gonna lie. I had never heard anything like it because um, at that time I was just coming out of high school. I was big in the swing jazz, but I also had went to the five week Berkeley, the Berkeley five week program. So I was hearing like all this crazy gospel music and rock and roll. Like I had heard music I had never heard before. Right? Like I that's that's like when I first heard of Animals as Leaders and stuff like that that I had never heard of. Right? Crazy so, good band. Man, crazy good. So I'm hearing this stuff. And I get to college, mind you, Nomadic, they playing swing. And then the song will go from swing to metal to like math rock and then go gospel. I said, oh, yeah, man. And you got a horn section too? <laughs> oh, and it was led by a horn section with no. Deshaun just, he has now, he didn't upgrade the band. He has a full orchestra now. Check it out. Um, He, Actually, he just dropped like eight projects last night. He dropped like eight albums last night. No lie. (laughs) (laughs) He dropped eight last night or something like that. But go check it out. Uh, It's called Urban Art Orchestra. It's crazy. It's like a 25-piece band, something. Because he got strings. He got horn section, rhythm section, singers. He got all that stuff. It's it's pretty nuts. Um, So that, that was the first time I was like, whoa. I've never heard nothing like that in my entire life. Like I've heard something similar, but not what horn players lead in the band. That was the thing I've heard, always heard killing bands, but I've never heard where 
oh, your horn player is actually as good as the drummer or better in a, in, in a different, in a more, in a rhythmical way, not just like, oh, I could outplay you, whatever. That was one of them. Um, and then I think the another one was uh, I was in high school and school, Cleveland School of Arts would send us out to do gigs, which I wasn't mad at. You know, I get to get out of school, make some money, get to dress yeah. up. I'm not complaining. And we were playing at uh the um the Cleveland Clinic Intercontinental, you know, the whole the hotel thing. I think on Chester yep. or whatever. And we was we was playing over there and my whole rhythm section, all of them had rolled together and they caught a flat tire. So I had like three guys in the car together and they all was all late. And um so I went over to the contact person because I'm the band leader, so I went over to the contact person. You know, I let her know the situation. And she was like, well, you know, what what you want to do? I told her, I said, I know I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to get paid. So I started playing. <laughs> I started playing. I was I was prepared to play two hours of solo sax by myself. It didn't bother me. It's just like practicing at home. That's how I figured. Mm-hmm. And wow. um, I played, uh, I, I got probably like 30, 40 minutes into playing by myself. And I, I I went over and I played this ballad, Body and Soul, which is like one of my favorite ballads uh, to play. And then like as soon as I finished playing, this lady came over to me like bawling, crying. And I was just like, man, what happened? Like <laughs> I thought I had did something to her. And she was like, she came over. She was just like, she had a hundred dollar bills. Like I just want to get this to you. And I never had been tipped on the gig before. So I was like, first of all, what you tipping me for? She was crying. She was like. That was my husband's favorite song, and he passed away like a couple years ago. Oh man! And she was like, and we will always listen to it. She was like, I've never heard nobody ever play that song live ever in my entire life. Wow. And she was like, I was, you know, she was having a bad day, and I just she ended up she was doing something at the hotel, and I just happened to be in the lobby playing that song when she walked in. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. crazy. Yeah. That was that was that was definitely different, you know. What I mean, because it sh- it it showed me how much like this music really affects people, you know. Yeah, at such a young age as well, man. It shows you. Yeah, yeah. The power I couldn't been. Has. I definitely was in seventeen. I was probably about fifteen, sixteen when that happened. Damn. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That is that that is definitely fuel to the fire. Jumping forward now to where you are now. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I can I mean I couldn't see myself doing anything else, man. You know, it's uh I didn't put so much time into it. I try to I, I tell people uh me quitting saxophone now would be like somebody putting a hundred dollars into a stock portfolio since high school and then just burning it all on alcohol <laughs> in one day. <laughs> right. And we just gonna drink it all up and that's it. <laughs> like, you know. So I gotta roll with it and uh it took took a few friends to really talk me into saying like, "Yo, you got to do this and keep it going, no matter what happens." You know, so it's only getting better from here. That's right. Let's fucking go, baby. Woo! I'm amped. Yeah. I just want to run through a brick wall right now. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the first episodes, man. You had Klopp and I stumbling on all over each other trying to get uh, questions out, which clearly is a sign that we're gonna have to have you back on, JB. But again, yeah, thank man. you very much for spending your Thursday with us. Oh yeah, no problem. No problem. And your Instagram is at JB Good Music, right? Good music, JB. Ah, I had them flip flops. Uh, are there yeah. any other socials or places where folks can uh, find you? Um, you know, other than Spotify, YouTube Music, you know, got Abstract Sounds, uh, Instagram, Facebook, um, and then we have two shows actually coming up. So for all of the people that's down in Columbus, November 17th, we'll be at the Ginger Rabbit. And those tickets are selling very quick. I just I just happened to go on the website today because um, we were getting some people some tickets. And I was like, whoa, Dude, like more than like one of our sets is almost sold out. And the other one's like more than halfway sold out already. Um, November 17th, you said? Yeah, November 17th. I and got then, nothing uh, on my calendar and my wife is out of town. <laughs> yeah, we got that going. And then November 25th, 
We're actually doing a really cool show at uh, Coda. We'll be with Wave Magnetic and um, uh, Community Shoe. Hell yeah. Let's go. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing a three-band bill. I love those, man. We, I rarely get to play those nowadays if it's not a, like a festival, you know. So it's going it's to be a hang November 25th. And then other than that, uh, just be, be on the lookout for merch because I just dropped two designs. Shout out to James Quarles. If y'all know James, James put me together for the uh for our my astronaut themed t-shirt, which I gotta get you guys some t-shirts when we drop these soon. Vice oh, versa, yeah. my friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make a little trade. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Heck yeah, man. Like I said, next uh next year and just trying to go on hopefully go on the road, eat, hit the east coast a little bit next year. You know, love it. Awesome, man. Well, again, JB, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, and I'll be looking out for those shows as well. But uh, besides that, my name is Spruce. I'm Clap, and we got our boy JB here in the studio with us. And again, this has been another episode of Vinyl Stallion. Stallions. Yeah, you yeah, already know. Hey, and thank you guys for having me. It's your boy Javon Bogart, Good Music JB once again, and I'll be seeing y'all soon. Peace. Thank Hell you, everybody. Yeah.